The race is on to replace Andrew Scheer as Conservative Party leader. Maybe not officially, but just one day after his resignation, some Conservatives are already openly testing the waters for a leadership bid. And one has actually jumped right in. The CBC's Catherine Collins spent the day on Parliament Hill gathering that news. She joins us now. Hi, Catherine. Hey, Vashi. Great to have you back Nice on the to show. be show. Welcome back. Who Who's first out of the gate? Yes, yeah, so I should say, it's, this is maybe not a formal announcement, but we do know that Conservative Foreign Affairs critic Aaron O'Toole is going to be running. He was at a Christmas party in Toronto last night. I'm told uh, Ontario Premier Doug Ford was there, about half of the Progressive Conservative Cabinet, and that Mr. O'Toole, according to a source I have who was in the room, is openly telling people that he is going to run. Now, of course, we don't even know the parameters for this race yet. We're still waiting to hear from the Conservative Party. How are they going to organize the leadership race? I don't think anybody will formally throw their hat in the ring until we have a little bit more information. We will have to wait and see, but it does seem pretty clear that Mr. O'Toole uh, is interested. We will recall that he came in third last Last time, so perhaps not not that big of a surprise. As close to formal as it gets, it yeah. seemed. Speaking <laughs> of, another big name being floated for the job, Peter McKay. CBC yes. caught up with him as That's well. That's right. Our own Hannah Thibodeau spoke to him today. And obviously, the first question was, are you going to run? Let's listen to what he had to say. I think it's far too soon to make a decision of this magnitude. And so uh, I will obviously take the time necessary and speak with a lot of people, first and foremost with my family. And... Um, it's a, it's a massive decision that affects not only me, but a lot of people around me that I care about. Obviously, yeah, I have young kids and, uh, and my wife too. This, uh, this will impact them in a, in a very serious way. So we're having a discussion. We're going to talk to a lot of people and uh, that's what would be expected as, as I'm sure others are doing as well. Now, we have to think that probably a few of those discussions with his family have happened already, Vashi, but certainly he is hedging publicly. But uh, Hannah was able to ask him about the news that Mr. O'Toole is telling people he's in the race. And here is what Peter McKay had to say about that. Aaron is a great guy. I, uh, I think he performed extremely well, not only in the House, but in the last leadership race. So I would expect that he's looking very seriously, you know, looking very seriously at this as well. Now, that's particularly interesting, Vashi, because, of course, Aaron O'Toole and Peter McKay would be going after re a really similar contingent in the Conservative Party. You can see everything is so friendly right now, right? The race hasn't officially started. Everyone is being so nice. It is going to be very interesting to see how the dynamics of this race shape up. And speaking of those dynamics, who else is being speculated about? Lots of names being bandied. Around. Yeah, it's just wild, eh, when you talk to people, the number of names that are coming up. Uh, let's talk about somebody that you're going to have on the show in a moment. MP Michael Chong is certainly not ruling out the possibility of a leadership run. We heard from Marilyn Gladue today, another Conservative MP, perhaps a little bit less of a household name. She says she is being encouraged to run, that she is thinking about it. You can see up there on your screen, Ronna Ambrose. There is a name that comes up again and again. We heard MP Tim Upple today saying he'd like to see her run. Former Saskatchewan Premier Brad Wall, some people thought maybe he'd throw his hat in the ring. He says no. He tweeted today he won't be doing it, but he would also like to see Ronna Ambrose uh, make a run at the leadership. Of course, the big issue there, a lot of folks say saying she's enjoying private life. Maybe that's something she's not necessarily interested in right now. So uh, this is just the beginning of the speculation, <laughs> Vashi. I'm sure we're going to have a lot more chances to talk about this. I bet we will. Thanks, Catherine. You're welcome. CBC's Catherine Cullen. As she mentioned, 24 hours after Andrew Shearer's resignation, there are already a lot of possible candidates to replace him. Earlier this afternoon, I spoke with one of them. Michael Chong is an Ontario Conservative MP and former leadership candidate. Hi, Mr. Chong. Great to see you. Hello, Vashi. Great thanks, to be here. Thanks a lot for coming in. I, I want to start. I want to look towards the future of the party, but first, I want to start off and ask you about Mr. Shear's resignation. Did it take you by surprise? Yeah, it did. Um, it was Thursday. National caucus had finished the day before, and it took me by surprise. It was a sad day yesterday. It's not uh, fun to see somebody go through a leadership race, work so hard to lead the party, and then make the decision to step down. Do you think it was the right decision? I think it was the right decision, not just for the party, but also for Andrew. I think he clearly was under a lot of pressure, but I think also he's got a family, Jill, and five kids, and I think it was taking a toll on the family. So I hope that he takes some time this holiday to spend some time with his wife and kids and uh, take some well-deserved rest from what has been a grueling three-year campaign. Some of your colleagues have been uh, raising questions about another story that came out yesterday involving Mr. Shear, and that is that he used party funds to pay for, he had an agreement with the leadership of the party to mm -hmm. use party funds, or at least someone in the leadership of the party, to use that money to pay for his kids' private school. Uh, what do you think of that? 
Well, I don't think it's fair for me to comment on exactly what happened because I don't actually know the details. But I will say this, I think in general, a good test of whether or not an expense is appropriate is not whether or not it's legal, it's whether or not you would have incurred the expense had you not been in the job. And I think that's a good test to apply whenever you're considering whether to expense something to the party or to the taxpayer. If you apply that uh, that lens, do you think then it was? I mean, I'm not even saying Mr. Well, Shear. I'm it, saying um, on behalf of the party. Like, yeah, it's and hard I only to say. say that because there's a lot of people coming on this show saying that doesn't pass the smell test. Well, it, I, we don't know how much the the what the amounts were. We don't know for what duration they were paid. Uh, we don't know any of the details of what happened. So it's not fair to say whether it was appropriate or not until you get those details. While you're waiting for those details and while those questions remain, mm -hmm. is it appropriate for Mr. Shear to continue or is it good from your perspective for Andrew Shear to continue as interim leader? Yeah, because he's not actually interim leader, he's full leader. He's leader, he, he's sorry, leader yeah, you're party. right, leader yes. until he gets replaced. That's right, and so under the, I think we have to follow the rules and procedures of the party and the caucus and the rules and procedures are clear. Um, it's only in the event that the leader has resigned that you trigger the selection or election of an interim leader. In this case, he, his resignation is effective the election of the new leader. So the rules do not provide for uh, the mandatory election or selection of a new leader. Should he, though, be resigning earlier than that, I guess, is the question I'm asking. Then. Well, I think, look, I think we're probably looking at a short leadership race, so I think it's reasonable uh, to have a period of stability going into that vote, which could take place in as little as four or five months. Uh, it's not like the last time where it, Rana w was elected interim leader because Mr. Harper had resigned effective immediately, and so Rana had an 18-month period to be interim leader. I think this is a different situation where we could be looking at a very short leadership race, and I'm not sure that we need the instability of changing the leadership at this time while we're conducting uh, a leadership vote in the party. Do you think a shorter leadership race would be a good thing? Like, do you think your party needs to find someone to replace Mr. Shear sooner rather than later? I think so. Um, I think the last race was very long. I know I ran in that last leadership race. <laughs> we covered race. it. We remember it too, yeah. <laughs> and it was some 15 months, uh, 14 months for our campaign, which was a very long leadership race. So I think it's better to have a shorter race this time, but also because it's a different context. We have a hung parliament and we could have an election at any moment in time. Are you going to run in that leadership race? Well, we'll see. Uh, what I do know is this. I think it's important that the next leader of the Conservative Party be able to unite the party and its different wings, but also a leader who can grow the party, particularly in cities in eastern Canada, in the Vancouver Lower Mainland, a leader that can appeal to millennial voters, which now are a bigger voting block than seniors in this country, uh, and a leader that can extend the reach of the party in uh, regions where we haven't traditionally won. So what that means is that we need to grow the party from winning just 34 or 33% of the electorate to a party that can win 40%. And I think part of the solution here is to wait for John Baird's report. You know, John's a former cabinet colleague of mine uh, who, uh, who, for whom I've got a great deal of respect. He's still writing his report. It's about the lessons learned from the last campaign, what went right, what went wrong, because I also believe that uh, it can't all be laid at Mr. Shear's feet, that part of what happened in the last campaign had to do with our overall party, with folks like me and others in the party, and how we uh, participated in that campaign. So we have to wait for his report, and the next leader, whomever that person is, needs to take a look at those recommendations and make changes in the party uh, to make sure that next campaign we can win. Beyond the campaign itself, or beyond um, whatever Mr. Baird says, what does your gut tell you about what went wrong? My gut tells me that uh, we didn't do as well on the issue of climate change. To appeal to voters, millennials, to appeal to voters in urban areas, um, I base that on what I heard from candidates who didn't win in the 905. Uh, I think the other thing that we need is a leader who will stand for marriage equality, who will stand for women's reproductive rights, while at the same time saying to social conservatives, to, people, to Canadians of deeply held religious convictions, that they are welcome in our political system, they're welcome in the Conservative Party. So the next leader has to be able to reconcile those two differences. I think Mr. Harper did that for the nine, ten years that uh, he was in power, and so we need a leader who can, who has the skills to do that. How, how difficult will that be, though? If you're a leader, let's say, who does choose to march in a pride parade, but you've got social conservatives who said even Andrew Scheer wasn't socially conservative enough for them. How, how difficult a task is that? Well, I think, 
I think it starts as a, as a leader of the party, as a potential prime minister, to say to all Canadians that you have a place in this party and that as prime minister, uh, we will have a government that reflects all Canadians. And that means a prime minister who believes in marriage equality, who believes in women's reproductive rights, but also a prime minister who at the same time says social conservatives are an important part of the Conservative Party and they have the right to stand up and speak on behalf of their deeply held convictions, they have the right to vote freely on the Foral House of Commons. So I think that approach can reconcile those differences with the So for the party. example, you as leader of the party would never whip a vote if a private member's bill came up that was about uh, abor access to abortion? That's right, except for members of the cabinet. I think uh, my view is that as prime minister, my government would never introduce nor support legislation on those kinds of issues. But if you're not in the government, then I believe it should be a free vote because that's consistent with not just conservative principles, but with principles of, of the freedom of conscience, that people should be able to stand on matters of conscience and express themselves and vote freely. You held the beliefs you did uh, in 2017. You also supported uh, a carbon tax at that's the right. time, and you won 9% of the vote. Are you worried, I guess, are, are you worried that uh, if you do run, you would face the same circumstances? Well, I've always believed that market mechanisms are the best way to deliver public goods. For example, Jason Kenney, Premier Kenney in Alberta, has just announced a $30 per tonne carbon tax on large emitters. But not on the consumption side of things. No, that's correct. So I think we need to have a political consensus, and we can't move forward without that political consensus. In some, in some cases, that will mean using the most economically efficient way to reduce emissions, like Premier Kenney has done with large emitters with the $30 per tonne carbon tax in Alberta. Or in other cases, it will mean taking a different approach, which may not be as economically efficient, but which has broad public support. And I, there's a very good example here in North America of that exact kind of approach, and that's the state of California. California is a global leader in climate change. In fact, it met its Copenhagen targets three years ago in 2016, three years early. And their economy that's roughly the size of Canada's, in fact, it's bigger than Canada's, 42 million people living in the state of California. They're, they're, they're the fifth largest economy in the world. And they achieved their climate change goals not through any one measure. It wasn't just a carbon tax or just cap and trade. It was through uh, over a dozen different measures they took, everything from incentives to uh, corporate average fuel economy standards for passenger cars and light trucks, mm -hmm. and they have been successful in doing it. And I think a key component of what they did was they built a bipartisan consensus amongst Republicans and Democrats in that state about how to reduce emissions. In fact... But your party didn't even, with respect, your party in the last election didn't even want to promise they'd meet the targets. They yeah. sort of said, we'll do our best. That's how right. are you going to get that consensus among members of your own party? Well, I think voters delivered a verdict on our party in the last election, and that's why we're having a leadership race, and those are some of the debates we will have in the coming months. Fair point. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Mr. Chong. Appreciate it. <laughs> I'm considering it. Um, Regardless of the role I play, though, uh, I think we need to build a much bigger Conservative Party, a party that uh, we need a leader that can unite the party, keep all the different parts of the Conservative family, the Conservative movement together, while at the same time growing our support in large cities, in Ontario, in Quebec, and appealing to a greater number of Canadians. Well, I've had a lot of people encouraging me to consider running for the leadership, so over the Christmas season, I'll certainly take it under consideration. The Conservative Party is still reeling from yesterday's surprise announcement from leader Andrew Scheer that he's stepping down. But, of course, already speculation is growing about possible leadership contenders. Time to bring in the power panel to see what they think of those contenders. Negan Sinclair writes for the Winnipeg Free Press. He joins us from Winnipeg. Over in Montreal, the Logic's Marty Patrickin joins us. And here with oh. me in studio, Le Devoir's Marie Vastel. And next to her, McLean's Paul Wells. Hi, guys. Hi. Hey nice to see you. Hello. Ha Bonjour. Hello. Ha happy Friday. Uh, Marie, why don't I start with you? Sure. So those are just two examples. Uh, Aaron O'Toole, Catherine Cullen was reporting yeah. earlier, has basically said officially, not, I mean, he said it to other Tories in last private. night, in, <laughs> officially in private that he's going. Peter McKay, very publicly today, saying yeah. that he's considering it as well. What do you think of the crop of candidates just, you know, 24 hours later that, have, that has already emerged? Well, I think um, there are front runners and maybe question marks. No, I shouldn't say that. That's not nice. But people who, <laughs> depending who runs, might not have a, as big a shot as they would hope. Uh, I think Marilyn Gladu is, is considering it, and, and that's great. She actually had interesting policy proposals in the last government, and she is someone that's quite interesting in terms of policy and politics. But 
you also have Michael Chong, who wants to try his run again, and he finished fifth last time. Um, Aaron O'Toole, I think, did raise his profile last time by running. He came in third mm -hmm. after Mr. Shearer and Mr. Bernier, which was a surprise to many. Uh, I think he's well regarded in the party, but it feels like the big question now is kind of who's who's going to be the star candidate running that this time that didn't run last time in 2017 because they thought they had no shot of winning government in 2019. This time it seems like there is more of an opportunity to win the next time because Mr. Trudeau has been reduced to a minority government because they will have been in power when there's an election for six or eight years or however long this government lasts. And so maybe some people who uh, passed last time, like Peter McKay, would run this time. And I think if people like that do, then the MPs that are mulling it right now, like 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 Candace Bergen apparently, uh, or Pierre Poliver, uh, might not be as high up in the list. Uh, that being said, uh, I would note that Mr. McKay, as far as I know, is still not bilingual. Uh, neither Ish. is Rana Ambrose. Yeah. Uh, actually, people seem to think Rana wouldn't run anyway. People seem to say she's quite content with her private life and she's enjoying it. Uh, but another big name that I would wonder was was thrown around last time and he didn't run is Bernard Lord, mm -hmm. which is getting a lot of support from Quebec MPs right. or senators who would like to see yep. him. Pa Paul, does there need to be a star candidate in the mix? Um, I don't think there will be one. I asked, uh, I asked a close associate of Andrew Shears, first of all, what the hell just happened, and then what's going to happen <laughs> next? I said, what does the field look like? And this person said, saviorless. Um, uh, right then. You know, I thought maybe, especially because Corey Tanaik, who's from Saskatchewan, was part of the anti shear mm -hmm. putsch, that maybe that was, they were lining up behind Brad Wall, and then he's not in. And, and um, I think a lot of conservatives who thought they were gonna get Brad Wall are now seeing Mar Marilyn Gladue, who I'm awfully fond of, but that's a different, that's a different kind of level uh, on the pecking order. I've actually done some reporting. Um, Rod Phillips, the Ontario treasurer, is almost certainly not going to run. He hasn't delivered his first budget yet. Uh, and uh, he doesn't want to upset um, Doug Ford. And perhaps for that reason, Mark Mulrooney, the um, mm -hmm. uh, Bay Street lawyer, uh, is taking the weekend to consider. Uh, he. Mm -hmm. he um, like Phillips, like Mulrooney, probably every mid middling prominent conservative in the country is getting an avalanche of phone calls from people saying, uh, you can't win if you don't play. And so uh, there's, 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 a lot of, um, there's a lot of action. And uh, I, I, I think in the end, the field will be smaller than it looks right now. But as I say, um, if you're known to be a conservative, I'm, I'm kind of sad no one's called to ask me. Uh, because <laughs> everyone else is are. getting called. <laughs> you know, it's funny, Bur Bur uh, Maxine Bernie asked himself and he said no. Said, yeah, so yeah that was interesting too. <laughs> what do you think, Marty? Uh, you know, I, I put the question to a, to a liberal source of mine. I sort of gave him the, the laundry list that's been floating around. And I, you know, if I can go emoji for a second, I, I was like, what, did, what were your first uh, reactions upon Andrew Shear's thing? And it, and it was like, uh, surprise emoji. And then, oh, darn, the party's over emoji. Uh, they they would have really liked to have Andrew Shear hang around. It was interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, but so the question I put to them was essentially, you know, you being a liberal uh, and wanting to see the liberal brand uh, continue going after the next election, who would you like to see elected to the, or who would you like to see uh, become leader? And the two names they said was Michelle Rempel and Pierre Polyev. So mm -hmm. if you guys are in the running, the liberals want you to run. Uh, the top two were interesting was, was Rona Ambrose and Michael Chong with everybody else in the middle, with a lot of caveats in there, you know, Bernard Lard not necessarily sure what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. So all is to say is that uh, you know there are people that the liberals really would like to have this party continue going, and there are, there are certainly some that aren't. Uh, I think personally, I think the the most interesting one uh, myself is is Michael Chong. I think uh, yeah. uh, I think the I think the idea that uh, of having him come in and and basically having that sort of star power of being able to go in into a party and say, look, the way that you guys have been doing th these things for the last however long it was last it was 2017, what didn't work. Uh, we have to turn this around. We have to be unequivocal on issues like abortion. We have to be unequivocal on questions of gay rights. We have to be unequivocal on questions of climate change. Um, I hearken if back Chong to- If won't do it, maybe they could get Christian Freeland. <laughs> yeah, there you go. She'd yeah. be just as likely yeah, but, to, but, to lead the, the Conservative is, Party I, as but, he would. But, but that's, that's part <laughs> of, when that's you part said of Michael problem. Chong, I wish you could have seen the reaction of Marie and, and Paul. They, they don't I don't think they share your view. No, I think policy-wise, he's super interesting. I agree with you, Marty. I just don't know if- 
He has the the, the mojo of but someone. I think what Marty means is that he's he could because of the policies he puts forth and what he says he could be a threat, right? Yeah. Or at least that's the thing. And, and and look, I I put the I put the name to this person like everybody else, and they're they're they'd be frankly scared of them. I just find it's I mean you you ask the enemies who they would don't want, and that's the that's the first name out of their mouth. Nigan, what do you think? Uh, the, well, yeah, you know, like out in the West here, uh, it's, uh, in the newspapers here, immediately everybody turned to Jason Kenney, and it's kind of interesting to to talk okay. about provincial leaders as Brad Brad Wall and Jason Kenney. I mean, I've heard Doug Ford's name come up, and and I read an article this morning about he's the Stephen Harper coming back. It's very interesting to show uh, within the current uh, cabinet or the current uh, uh, circles of conservative insiders, what, the fact that there is no interesting candidate, there is no thrilling candidate, kind of indicates that there is a kind of an interest of reaching back towards even a, a Stephen Harper and so on. And I know, of course, none of, I don't see any of those one, ones running, particularly Jason Kenney who's come out and said he won't run. However, it is very interesting that uh, the, what the conservatives need is a progressive candidate. They need someone to, they've already got a social conservative capital here in the prairies. They're, they've got a block vote. There's absolutely no problem at all whatsoever okay, if they move toward a progressive candidate and moving towards somebody that's perhaps uh, Bernard Lord out in Quebec or someone who can be progressive, someone who could appeal to Ontario voters like Michael Chong. Marie, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I, is it, I, I guess the question for me is yeah. around this idea of a progressive conservative. Mm -hmm. I feel like society writ large looks at it and sees that as obvious. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure all the conservative members think yeah, so. That's we know that I mean. from the evidence in the last leadership exactly. race in 2017 where yeah. you had social conservative, social conservative, social, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, 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 they play a big part in voting for a leader. I'm not yeah. saying that anyone's wrong thing, in saying that the yeah. larger public is looking for something different. Yeah, but. I think that's the challenge for this race. It sort of is at every race, but I think what you're hearing a lot, like what, what I've been hearing unanimously, maybe because other voices um, didn't speak to media in the past two days, but unanimously is it has to be someone who's more progressive. And not only in terms of social issues, but also in terms of an environment mental policy, uh, social policies like housing, or, or just to, to broaden ideas and have uh, more bold ideas. But I'm also hearing social conservatives saying, uh, not so fast, we're not going to let you just um, switch the party just like that. First of all, as you said, they, they are numerous. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of social conservatives who vote conservative. Uh, they are organized. And last time, like you said, uh, their candidate, their preferred candidates came in, well, six, but uh, fourth, Brad Trost, and then all of his votes went to Mr. Shear, mm -hmm. which made him win. Um, so granted, yeah. conservatives might want someone more progressive. I just don't know if that's how the race would well, shape up. And, my, and, and I don't I know if there is absolutely no risk to it, angering that part of the quick party. points from each of you, Marty and Nigan, and then I got to take a quick break. Yeah, just just quickly. But my, my only thing is, that, uh, uh, these leadership co uh, conventions and these leadership situations are the perfect time for for people to go look. Yeah. Okay, social conservatives, fine, but you, demonstrably it didn't work. Yep. We're not going to get elected, and that gives this this almost gives it's the greatest thing that's happened since Michael Ignatieff scampered off to to academia in 2011. You get to go and turn around and go look. What you're doing doesn't work. It doesn't matter. I don't care what your views are. We have to get elected. I just don't know if they would listen. Yeah, Nigan, go for it. Pierre, Poliv uh, Pierre Poliver is, a, is really the optional candidate. If, it's, if the party wants to move towards a social conservative agenda, that also have kind of a fresh face on that social conservative agenda, Pierre Poliver is the way to go. However, I'm really interested to see any support that he gets off at the beginning. Uh, Paul, is there a, an ideal candidate to replace Andrew Shearer? No, even among... So he, I talked to some uh, Western uh, reform-rooted church-going conservatives today. And I said, what about Ronna Ambrose? And they said, well, Ronna spent the last year running interference for Justin Trudeau on NAFTA, and that made the parliamentary caucus's job a lot harder. And so um, uh, a lot of, so it's interesting that Jason Kenney and Brad Wall, who weren't around for that, think she'd be great. Mm. People who were around uh, in, in parliament in the last year are not as fond of Ms. Ambrose as they used to be. Okay, then how about Stephen Harper? Uh, yeah. I talked to guy, someone who worked in that uh, government at senior levels for the entire decade, is proud of every... Uh, or most things that government did, and said, that just looks too much like back to the future. Mm -hmm. If we can't find a next yeah. leader beyond Stephen Harper, then what are we doing? Yeah. So um, uh, I spent the last month warning these people that uh, getting rid of Sheer would be the easiest decision they would have to make. And, uh, and now they're, 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 they have spent the day 
getting reacquainted with the real world and discovering that it offers no easy solutions. Negan, speaking of what uh, what went on with Andrew Scheer over the last 24 hours in the past few weeks, what do you make of, uh, I mean, there, were, there was a lot of conversation yesterday about whether or not he should even stay as leader until there's a permanent replacement, given this uh, this thing that came out that he was using party funds to pay for uh, private, private school, school for his kids. Is that uh, still a, a vulnerability for him? What do you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he spent the years railing on liberal uh, wasting of dollars, tax dollars, wasting on uh, buying the pipeline. Uh, the he, It was a very bad look, and it's a very bad look to use uh, party funding, especially with no approval of the, within the party to be able to use money to pay for his children's schooling halfway across Canada. And also, I mean, we can't forget that uh, Andrew Scheer spent not only time as uh, the official opposition leader, but also as the speaker living off the public dime. And so it was just a matter of time before people connected the dots and started to talk about the kind of public image that Andrew Scheer had. Listen, the, Andrew Scheer had a major credibility problem. It was a major public image problem. And it wasn't just a matter of being a climate change denier and, and not having any plan for climate change and, and not being a progressive voice, but he was really out of touch with the very party itself and the way that the party was moving and what the party wanted him to do. Uh, even though he did appeal on certain issues involving social conservative, and even that was, was hypercritical at times, confusing and not clear to hear. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, Marty, on uh, Mr. Scheer, I mean, he, he, it wasn't taxpayer dollars. It was, it was uh, just to be clear uh, for our viewers, Parties, it, it yeah. was, yeah, it was, it was money from the party, but it's the, it's the optics, right? It's criticizing Trudeau for the Aga Khan, for two, two nannies, for uh, fund, Silver maybe. Spoon and a trust fund, and then you're using money coming from donors, most of them donating less than $100, mm. and, and to putting it your, towards this, yeah. To your, to your kids' tuition, mm -hmm. yeah, especially, I mean, it's all, it's a, like, yeah. it, it gets worse, it's a bad look for it because you're a conservative you're supposed to be you know bootstrapping conservative who you know pays for stuff on their own and all that kind of stuff and he also positioned himself as the everyman compared mm -hmm. to yeah you remember that Justin commercial Trudeau, where he wore right? that, that slubby shirt and yeah. walked around like uh like he'd just fallen off a bench like yeah of course it, it's <laughs> It, uh, his whole image was built around sort oh, of a, the anti-Trudeau as being the Trudeau, exactly. the establishment, living off the public purse, a silver spoon in his mouth. It was a terrible look. That thing, I mean, I, I agree with Paul's point that, that it's easy to get rid of Andrew Scheer and harder to replace them. I, I, my only thing about it is that I think I'm, I'm relieved that they're doing it now and not, you know, dragging on this cacophony that would happen, follow him all the way up until the spring. Uh, to the leadership and probably pass that if he managed managed to eke it out in the spring. But isn't it uh, a problem though if they can't find anyone to replace Andrew Scheer? I mean, I I, granted they got more seats, they got more votes. Well, I mean, votes it's been 24 before. hours to be fair. But, yeah, yeah, but yeah. if this I know, Marie, analysis is correct that they can't find anyone ago. to do any better, I feel like that's quite concerning for the party given that in two or three years, Mr. Trudeau will have been in power for seven or six or seven or eight years, and he has had numerous scandals, and 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 they would have trouble finding someone to beat him. I feel like I that's know. a bigger I, I, problem I, where I, they I, actually I need look, to look at their I, I think, policies. I think it's, I think it's glass. Quickly, Marty, I, I then I get pollen. I think it's glass half full on that kind of thing. I think they. I think Trudeau went into the election with the economy doing really well, and he should, everything he, by all means he should have he should have cleaned house. He didn't. He won a minority. Uh, and look, it's political expediency being what it is, the next person that's the head of the Conservative Party is going to be somebody who believes that uh, that, that uh, climate change is an important thing and that the parties might exactly. have to Exactly. I think their on. problem is also policy, not just finding someone who looks a certain way or talks a certain way, but maybe thinking about what they're offering Canadians. Paul? Look, we may be overthinking things. If we're looking for somebody who's, here, who's yeah. uh, Eastern Canadian, urbane, um, uh, has marched in a pride parade and is uh, a known conservative. How about Tom Mulcair? Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Zing, uh, <laughs> zing. That's um, a good one. Uh, the, the next conservative leader is much likelier to be the prime minister than the next conservative leader seemed to be in 2017. So all the so-called upper echelon, top tier, Peter McKay ranking uh, people, they have no excuse. If they're not gonna run now, they're not gonna run. Mm. Uh, you know, John Charest, get yeah. back in the pool if you miss it, you know, whatever. Um, it should be a more interesting race. Nigan? 
Yeah, picking up the pieces on this, uh, uh, there is a wide open race for a conservative rebranding in this particular time. And, mm -hmm. and there's a, like I said before, uh, the social conservative vote is locked. It is locked on the prairies. There's absolutely no interest. There's no, I mean, I only have to be at a gathering and I hear, uh, I, I do a lot of speaking publicly. And when I show Trudeau's picture up on the, cr on the crowd, I mean, radically across the prairies, sort of everyone, either on the left or the right, is just radically booing him. And so they're, they're, the social vote here is fixed. So really, I think there's an opportunity for the Conservatives for one of the first times really since the Reform Party, since the uh, Canadian Alliance merger with the CPC, since th that period, uh, there's an opportunity to open up into Ontario with a really progressive candidate. And, and this is the time. I think if the Conservative Party were, were smart strategically, this is where they put their energy. And Marie, you talk about as well beyond who yeah. replaces uh, Andrew Scheer, what they put forward yeah. as the policies of the party. Yeah, because and I feel like Paul's going to disagree with me in like about two seconds, but I'll get what I think in the first. Um, because I I was actually disappointed as a political nerd in the last campaign, the last leadership campaign, that there really weren't that many broad um, policy debates. Granted, you had Max Bernier, who was very, very free market, free trade. You had Michael Chong, that was for a carbon tax. But other than that, like in terms of social policies, in terms of immigration, other than say, let's have a values test, in terms of, of uh, fiscal policy, in terms of, it, it just seemed like they were content to keep going with someone like Harper with a smile, Andrew Scheer, and, and not really think of, of, of bold ideas to switch things up. And I agree with Negan, I think this is an opportunity to say, okay, maybe we can't run on the Harper Agenda tax credit cuts, which were popular nine years ago, but not so much now. And maybe we need to sort of uh, modernize the party in terms of social issues, but also a whole other spectrum of issues. The, the party did, you know, um, agree for to decriminalize marijuana, but the party in the House of Commons won't do it. Uh, the party did modernize some policies. The, 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 the delegates at the, one of the last conventions wanted an, an environmental platform, but the party in the House of Commons didn't do it. Did I think the members are ready for a more modern conservative party that hasn't been offered to them so far. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.